tape for future generations. I know. Okay, well, good morning. Thank you for being with us here on Pentecost. And uh, sometimes we call it for him the birthday of the church. And this week, just to mix things up, like I said, there were actually two Bible verses for the readings. One was the story of Pentecost, as told in the book of Acts. And then the second one is a reading that finishes out our journey through um, the, the book of uh, Philippians. Uh, which is a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in the town of Philippi in the very early days of the Christian church. So, please pray. Gracious God, Holy Spirit of life, let your wind and flame blow through our lives and transform us. Open us up to new ways of being and living, and strengthen us with the courage of Peter and the wisdom of Paul. In the name of your Son, the living Christ. Amen. Amen. So what I love about our reading from Philippians, and really more or less the whole book, as we've been reading through it, is how much affection and kindness comes through from Paul to the Christians that he's writing to, from jail. These are people he helped bring to faith, and they've been through a lot together. The believers at Philippi have helped Paul stay alive during his long stay in prison. And I get the feeling that maybe they were his favorites, or at least, you know, at least he recognizes them and appreciates and wants to encourage their spiritual maturity. So the passage that we read comes towards the end of the letter. And as he's wrapping it all up, like he does kind of this like, in the beginning of the book, it's kind of like fixing various problems. And then he's like, and just as a reminder, and then that's like the second half of the book. And so in just a few sentences, as we read, Paul gives us the key to happiness, or at least to peace, um, the peace of God. Rejoice in God always, he says. And don't worry about anything. But with prayer and supplication, uh, let, your be, let your request be made known to God. So if you've always wondered what the secret to deep inner peace is, there it is, right there. Or at least the Christian formulation of it. Rejoice in what God's doing. Give thanks for those things. And don't worry. Just pray for what you need. So um, I think with that I can end the sermon here, right? Mm -hmm. okay, we got it. I mean, it's all laid out, you know, it's very clear. Except somehow, living this out, rejoice, don't worry, ask for what you need with prayer and thanksgiving, is a lot harder than just reading those words and maybe recognizing that, yes, that way of life would probably lead to inner peace. So first off, there's the rejoice part. We are 50 days out from Easter, that's literally what Pentecost means. And it is honestly enough time to have moved on to other things, other good news, other new iPhone apps, Whatever. Jesus is raised from the dead. The new world, the new reality that God has been imagining is coming into being. The oligarchs of our world today only appear to be immovably fixed. Jesus has saved the world, have conquered death, and we are and will be part of that new life. It's amazing. It's tremendous. It's the good news. But you know, other things come into the foreground. Some of them important, some not so important. And pretty soon the mystery and the beauty of Easter fade into the background. There's a reason that we celebrate Easter once a year, and not just on the big anniversaries. Um, like, what's the big anniversary? Every hundred years? I don't know. But let's have the reminder too today. God loves us deeply, enough to come into our common life as a fellow person, and to begin a whole new, beautiful reality. The kingdom of God, that will one day be how the whole world is, all the time. And Jesus' death and resurrection are the start. So we Next is, don't worry about anything. Which I have to say has echoes of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, when he tells his disciples to look at the flowers of the field, and look at the birds in the air, and how well provided for they are. And I've heard that sermon a couple of times, and somehow it doesn't stop me from worrying about things. Or at least thinking and thinking and thinking about them, which maybe is different, I don't know. But in either case, telling some of us not to worry feels a little bit like telling water not to roll downhill, right? Or it feels like a call to be irresponsible. Hakuna Matata, right? I'm kind of in a Disney kid lately because mm -hmm. of Frozen. Uh, but anyway, Hakuna Matata. Don't worry, be happy. Or the movie that was popular when I was little, look for the bare necessity, <laughs> the simple bare necessity. Forget about your worries and your strength. That's what right. That That's the jungle book. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's perhaps before your time. I remember. It's I not. It's, <laughs> it's not. Okay. <laughs> but somehow the, the um, movies, the cartoon characters who don't have any worries, 
Also don't have any children or leadership. They don't, you know. Just kind of hanging out. Well, they do that, you know, so, yeah. That's Timon and Pumbaa. That's right, that's right. Timon and Pumbaa. But I don't think that Paul is saying, hey, no worries, man. I think it's a time to become a ruthless rambler, you know. Instead to me, his closing is like, uh, feels like a benediction. Here's my hope and my vision for you. Don't shirk responsibility, but lift it up to God. Which is different, right? That's a difference. You're lifting it up to God. Make it part of your relationship with God. God knows what you need, but that's almost not the point. The point is the relationship. So I used to think, and I'm still not that great about it now, to be honest, but I used to think that you shouldn't pray for yourself, or I shouldn't pray for myself, I guess. That was kind of selfish and wrong to, um, to pray to God for the things that I was wanting and hoping for. Uh, and I don't believe that anymore, and yet somehow it's uh, the belief is kind of like it's kind of like treating God like Santa Claus, right? That you're like writing a letter to the North Pole, and I don't believe that anymore. And yet somehow it's still difficult to like lay it out before God and say, you know, I'd rather kind of hold on to my little knot of uh, string and like work on it myself than try and fly it up the kite and hope that that will pull it out and straighten it out. And so maybe I'm afraid that God won't answer. Maybe I'm afraid she will. Or maybe it's just the toddler's impulse, which is, I want to do it myself. Uh, but that brings us to the part of the letter that Paul slips in, in a way that makes it easy to accidentally skip over, which is that in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, he writes, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God. The thanksgiving is about recognizing all the things that God is already doing, all the things that are going well, all the questions that God is raising, and the callings that are drawing us forward into the future, that God is developing with our cooperation. Thanksgiving makes room for God in a way that a letter to Santa Claus doesn't. Because in the end, I don't believe that what comes from all this prayer is that we get every single thing that we want. At least not in the short run, right? Even though Jesus has been raised from the dead, people we know and love, and we ourselves, get hurt and sick when we die. Events do not always turn our way. The floodwaters come whether we like it or not. But Paul doesn't say, let your requests be made known to God and you'll get everything you want. Instead, the result of our prayers is the peace of God that passes understanding. The process of prayer of letting go of our worries and spending time giving thanks for what we have and all of it in conversation with God. In, an, in the end, develops a relationship of trust between us and God. And in the end, it's that trust that allows us the peace of God. At least I think that's how it works. Rejoice, don't worry, ask for what you need, and give thanks for what you have. Because prayer, a true encounter with God, can transform us. So as I mentioned before, Pentecost is sometimes called the birthday of the church. Because at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit arrives. Which is an interesting way of saying, how does the church start? It's when the Holy Spirit arrives. Before this, the disciples had Jesus, and then after he died and rose again, and then left the disciples to be 100% part of the new kingdom of God. After all that, the disciples didn't kind of didn't have any sort of direct presence or guidance from God until Pentecost. And then suddenly that spirit, that breath of God appears, and as we hear in the story from Acts, makes it possible for people all over the known world to hear undistinguished and parochial disciples share the good news of Jesus in their own native languages. And then Peter stands up and explains what Jesus means for the world, that he was crucified, died, and rose again as the beginning of a whole new world, a whole new life for everyone. And the people heard this good news, and they accept it, and they're baptized, and the church is born, which I am grateful for. Because if I had to do this rejoice, don't worry, pray, and give thanks business all on my own, I would be in trouble. I would be out of luck. I mean, as I was getting ready for the sermon, I was memorizing the Philippians verse to help kind of think it through. Right at the same time, I was also worrying about where are we going to, where's our space going to be? What if we change our time? You know, all this stuff. Like, I'm, and it's like, I'm memorizing on the one hand, don't worry about anything. And on the other hand, I'm worrying at the same time. Like, those things are happening within minutes of each other. Right? And so then, uh, then there was this moment where I was like, Duh, maybe think about the verse that you're memorizing for a day. So if I hadn't had accountability to the group, right, I would just sit there worrying. Although 
I guess if there wasn't a church, I wouldn't worry about it. But I'd find something else to worry about. You know, <laughs> Don't worry about that. There would be something else to worry about. <laughs> so instead of worrying, I would like to give thanks to God and lift up a prayer, or maybe a hopeful benediction in imitation of Paul's prayer for his beloved church of Philippi. About defeat. I am thankful for six of eight for many reasons. I am thankful for each person who's here. You don't have to be here, right? There are other things you could be doing with your time. But you choose to be here, to be part of a community, to spend time reflecting on the deeper realities of life, to rejoice and to remember God's work in your life, and to practice beauty and to develop community. And it's not exactly a mystery, but definitely a working of the Holy Spirit that each of you is here now since it's certainly not from my mad advertising skills. I'll tell you that. Um, I'm thankful that as a community, we can practice an extravagant welcome, that we can share with each other where we see God speaking in our own lives, and that we talk about the sermon after it's done, which we're going to do, so be warned mm -hmm. that that's coming. I'm thankful that we put our faith into action with our monthly service projects. I'm thankful for our sacred conversation on race and the way God is still speaking and leading us further on that journey. I'm thankful for the freedom we feel to find to try new things, that there's room for creativity here, and I'm thankful for the ways people bring their gifts, whether that's in music and song, whether that's in snacks, whether that's in generous financial support, care and welcome, a listening ear, a beautiful altar cloth, a diligent hand on the laptop, or a thoughtful reflection. This is a group effort, and I am grateful for the group's effort. And it's a reminder that God's spirit comes to the whole community. So my prayer and my supplication would be that we would continue to become a community where together we are helping each other to live out our faith, doing justice, loving extravagantly, and walking humbly with God. I would hope that together uh, we as a church would find ways to rejoice, to let go of worry, to pray for what we need, and to give thanks in every situation. Because the other thing I'm thankful for in this church and in the many churches I've been a part of in the past is that we aren't trying to do this all on our own. We are doing it together. And my last prayer is that the Holy Spirit would go ahead and move through our ranks too and give us the courage of Peter and the wisdom of Paul to do great things for God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.